broadcasting through our flagship station, KNYE, in Pahrump, Nevada. And worldwide on the Internet, this is Midnight in the Desert. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. This is an interview that I've wanted to do for 12 years since I began hosting paranormal-themed talk show radio. Um, And this was something really interesting because it took place almost exactly a month before I was born, and I grew up watching the footage and the stories on sightings and in search of and all of these great programs, and it fascinated me. For those of you that are not familiar, maybe you've been living in a cave somewhere, our guest this evening is Robert Gimlin. And uh, Bob is is best known for his firsthand eyewitness account of a Bigfoot. He was there on October 20th, 1967, when Roger Patterson filmed the now famous Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot film. Last year marked the 50th anniversary of that film footage, and he's here with us this evening to talk about that and talk about some other strange aspects of this story. Bob, thank you so much for agreeing to come on this evening. Well, thank you for allowing me to be on, David. Uh, yes. Hey, David, if it's okay with you, I'll just let you ask me uh, some questions, and then there's a few things that uh, I, I don't want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, if that's Certainly. okay. Uh, exactly. We will go through all of this. We've got quite a bit of time together here this evening. Yes, sir. I, I'm curious if you can start people off. Let's let's just kind of pretend this is brand new to the world. They're just finding this information out. Can you talk to me a little bit about your background? Did you, prior to this moment, did you ever have a thought or uh, an idea that something like Bigfoot existed? No, sir, I did not. And uh, I didn't know. I, I seen the word Sasquatch up in B.C., Canada, and... Uh, I had no idea what Sasquatch meant at that time. And there was a painting there, and uh, uh, it was a painting of uh, Bigfoot, of course. And uh, I just didn't understand because I I didn't have any interest in it at that time. So uh, it was all kind of new to me when Roger started to explain it all to me and play testimonials uh, uh, of folks that had had witness, eyewitnesses, and uh, different aspects of the of the bigfoot world the phenomenon of the bigfoot world so it uh it got me started in the in the early 60s uh, uh because i knew roger quite well uh at one time we were pretty close friends when we were both r- r- amateur rodeoing and so uh roger would uh, talk to me about it and i kind of didn't have a whole lot of time to go out and do field research at that time because I had a full-time job and a part-time job. Now, field research in the area that you were living, I mean, was there a lot of sightings of this creature? Of this creature? Had, had it been around there for a long time in, in the culture and in, in the surrounding area? Yes, there was. Uh, well, uh, Roger was talking to me about a number of different areas uh, of people that he had went and talked to, you know, traveled around different parts of Northwest California, Washington, and uh, Oregon mostly. So uh, the plaster casts and things that he showed me was taken in those different areas. And I think the majority of them was probably over, uh, well, some of them were BC, Canada also, but uh, the majority of them was over around the Olympic Peninsula area uh, in the rainforest and so forth. So, you know, I, I became interested in what it was because of the different testimonials that he played for me on that little cassette uh, tape player. Had he ever had an encounter himself with one of these creatures prior to this date in October of 1967? No, sir, I, I did not, David. I I had no uh, encounter. I had never seen a, a, a footprint in the soil because I basically hadn't been looking for anything like that because I wasn't aware that there was uh, such a uh, – you mind if I call them mountain folks? Sure, that's perfectly fine. Okay. You call them whatever you'd like. Well, I kind of like to call them that now because the name Bigfoot actually came out of California and the Sasquatch name came out of uh, up around B.C., Canada, I think, or Alaska. And so 
uh, the Bigfoot name came because of the size of the of the print and the dirt, uh, and that was uh, uh, that was uh, a guy by the name of of uh, Jerry Crew uh, was a road builder in that Six Rivers National Forest area, and uh, when he when he come back one morning after he'd been working on the roads and. And there was in the soft dirt. There was a lot of these big foot, big feet prints in the dirt. So that's where the name Bigfoot originated, in uh, in the Six Rivers National Forest in California by a man named Jerry Crew. So uh, you know uh, the size of the footprint uh, originally just originated the name of Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. And it's just went on from there. And so uh, there's so many different names for it for the Indian tribes and throughout uh, the country. Well, especially in the United States, there's hundreds of different names that uh, they use uh, Native Americans. Well, you said you had never had an encounter. Did no, Roger did Roger ever have any encounters since he was so interested in this and was out kind of doing field research prior to that October date? Had he ever seen anything that he told you about? No, he did not. I think his interest stemmed from uh, uh, a book that he read. Uh, I can't remember the doctor that um, right offhand. But anyway, uh, Roger was so interested in it about the Slick expedition in the in the mid fifties down uh Tom Slick, a multimillionaire with the Slick Airways out of Texas, uh mounted a Bigfoot uh or a an ex uh, uh, an expedition in that area. Mm-hmm. And and uh, of course the Jerry Crew footprints had already been found before that mid fifty expedition. And so there was quite a few men that I met after the expedition down there that I talked to uh, that stayed into the Bigfoot uh, research part of it and actually wrote articles and books and so forth. But uh, Roger told me that uh, that he had witnessed tracks, footprints, and had some of the plaster casts that he showed me. But he talked to so many different people that he was uh, confident that they were there, that they did exist, and there was out there, and he wanted to get more evidence, more proof that they existed. All right. Well, that that kind of walks us up to October of 1967. What was the thought process to go out to this area, and why were you bringing cameras and and film equipment? Okay, uh, David, uh, Roger... uh, it was the only one that had a camera, and um, but he took that camera with him wherever he went and talked to different people. And also, any footprints or evidence that he could film, he he did such. And so uh, uh, we went down there because we were called about. Uh, Roger was called basically. They didn't call me because I I I just wasn't available. I had so much work to do in so many jobs so uh uh in the in the fall of uh of october in october the fall of labor day weekend uh, apparently uh they put a a tank uh a big fuel tank in to fuel up the road graders and the cats that they were building roads along the top of the mountains there to start logging in that area and so when they came back on Tuesday morning to go to work, there was three different sizes of footprints around this tank in that soft dirt. And they assumed that it was a male, female, and a juvenile uh, from the sizes of the prints. So uh, the, they, uh, the people down there that witnessed that called Roger because they knew he was very interested, and he'd been down there and talked to him about it before different ones like Al Hodson and Jerry Crew and the, the different ones that was working in the area, same area that Tom Slick put the expedition on in the mid-50s. So uh, Roger called me and come in. Well, he actually came into my place and caught me out there uh, doing work in the fields. 
and so he said, Bob, uh, I had a nice little truck with, I built a van on the back to haul horses in. And it was a dual wheel Chevrolet truck. I was a couple of years old at that time. And uh, uh, Roger wanted to know if I could take him down there to Northern California to uh, to look at these footprints and um, do some field research at that time. Well, I had never seen a footprint out in the wild, and I wanted to see one because by then, Roger played enough cassettes to me and talked to me enough about it that it was stimulating my interest considerably. So I thought, well, uh, I'll ask. Uh, I was working at the time and also had a ranch, as cattle and horses. And so I went and talked to the guy about getting some time off. Well, it, uh, 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 David, it was a hot roofing job. I was roofing for a company, and I was the last man hired. So I knew in the fall of the year when the work got slack, I'd be the first man laid off. Okay. So I went and talked to him, and he said, yeah, I'll take a couple of weeks off if you want, Bob, because we haven't bid any jobs right now, and it's getting slow. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm probably going to be laid off in a month or so, so I told Roger, yeah, I'll take you down there. So we loaded up everything, and uh, he told me where to go. So I went in there, and we went in there and camped by a place called Bluff Creek. And uh, uh, we rode every day miles. But I'll get, I jumped a little bit there because I wanted to see those footprints in the dirt. Well, uh, human beings had come up around it after they heard about it and tracked all around it, and then it had rain really heavy. So it was messed up so bad, there was not really a great uh, footprint that you could identify as a, a, whole, a whole footprint. So I was a little disappointed, but I uh, had a little time. I asked for a couple of weeks off, so Roger said, well, why don't we stay here and ride some uh, ride quite a few every day and see if we can go down in the draws around where the crick, cricks are in different places where we might find another uh, some more footprints. Well, that was that's what I really wanted to see is some footprints. Had no idea that I would see the real thing that made the footprints. Didn't even think that I'd see one. So the twentieth day after we'd rode all these miles of uh, it was uh, a beautiful, sunshiny day, and uh, the all the the trees and uh, shrubs and brush and all was turning yellow and red with fall colors. And that particular day, it was a real sunshiny, warm day. So we left camp there, heading back with a little pack horse with some equipment that we needed to stay uh, for a couple of days further back, we was going to go about 35, 40 miles further back than some of the area that we had been riding around. We'd make big circles every day, uh, kind of such as if you would if you were gathering cattle. But uh, that's what we were doing, searching for more evidence. And uh, uh, we just left camp that early afternoon and rode about four miles and uh, we had been by this area before and didn't, you know, didn't think much about it because the creek was down low. Uh, you know, in the fall, the creek recedes an awful lot. And uh, we come around a bend in the trail alongside the creek where a, a big downfall tree root system had turned up. And apparently the creek rerouted itself around that. And just as we rounded that, there was one standing across the creek, uh, pro- approximately 60, 70 feet from where we were at at that time. And Roger was riding in front of me. And to get back to the camera, Roger kept that camera in his left saddlebag uh, uh, with uh, with one of the, the flaps unbuckled so he could get it out fast if he needed to get it out. And that's exactly what he did is both horses acted up a lot. Rogers really got pretty rowdy and jumping around. Well, Roger was able to step off the horse and pull the camera out of the saddlebag at the same time. And I was about 12, 14 feet behind him. 
leading the pack horse. I turned the pack horse loose, let him run back down towards our camp. And I stayed on top of the big horse that I was riding. And Roger ran across the creek with the camera up to his face. Of, and uh, then he, he got on the other side and the bank raised up about three feet or so. And Roger tripped on that because he had the camera up to his face. He fell down on his elbows and uh, uh, then he filmed a little more and he got up and relocated where he do better. So this just kind of went on extremely fast and uh, uh, it was so, uh, when you ask about the camera, uh, Roger had that uh, uh, type of camera. I wasn't that familiar with that camera. Uh, it was one of those uh, 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 little cameras that you wind up, you know, and then take pictures with it. So uh, that's how it all went, David. And uh, uh, then as it walked away, as the film footage that you talked about that you saw, that is the film footage that we acquired from that, uh, those few seconds or a few minutes that we was able to view it as it walked away from us. And uh, Well, Bob, uh, can I ask you this? Would you are riding up over and you say there, then there's one standing there at first glance. Did you think it was a person? Did you think it was, you know, nothing out of the ordinary or could you tell the minute you, you got this in your, uh, you know, glance that this was something extraordinary? Well, yes. Some, I, I immediately realized it was something extraordinary. And basically I had seen drawings, uh, of, uh, folks that said that's what they, appeared to look like when they they could they see them leaving or walking or facing them or whatever so i i could tell it wasn't a human being of the size of it and the tremendous muscle underneath the hair uh the skin or the hair you might say and uh uh, i thought oh my god they really do exist and here's one right here in front of us walking away and uh, uh the the size of it was just so so overwhelming, it, you know. Uh, I could, even from the top of a big horse, uh, I was approximately, uh, you'd say, sitting in the saddle or where you know in the saddle or even jumping around. I was a little over twelve feet, uh, uh, or about eleven or twelve feet up, see, from the top of a sixteen-hand horse, and. Uh, so I, I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, you know, it is so big, it's unreal. And I could tell the way it walked, it was human-like because it just walked right out like anybody would. And taken, uh, it didn't seem like it was taking a long stride, but, but the stride measured out uh, 42 to 48 inches and in, in from heel to toe. So it was covering ground rapidly, and it wasn't even walking fast. It just seemed to be walking. So, you know, none of this was put together until after uh, it disappeared up another little canyon. When you see this, and all of a sudden, it goes from a legend, Bob, to reality. This is something that not a lot of people in the world can experience. Can you explain to me what that initial feeling was for you? Was it, was it fear? Was it just excitement? Was it complete astonishment? Well, it, David, it was about all three of those. You see, <laughs> uh, we'd been down there riding for two, three weeks, right. and 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 I was getting, you know, I mean, I ride a, a lot of hours and long miles a lot at home. But it was getting to the point where I was a little tired, you know, because you didn't sleep real good at night. Uh, we'd talk about what we were going to do the next day and, uh, you know. But uh, it was just like all three of what you said uh, wasn't too much fear because it was happening so dramatically fast. I didn't have a lot of time to get uh, have any fear. But I didn't, I also was a little bit skeptical when I stepped down off the horse. uh, So, uh, you know, I couldn't do anything with the horse jumping around. So (laughs) I stepped down off the horse and I pulled my rifle. I had a 30 socks, 
30 out six rifle and I never raised it to my shoulder. I just kept it down because I thought, well, if this thing, if this thing comes back at me, I, I can't make a shot on top of a horse jumping around. So I want to be on the, I want to be standing on the ground. Well, that famous 365 or 354 or something film where it turns its head to look when I step down off the horse. And so that's what it was kind of all about uh, there, David. Uh, it wasn't really fear. It was just uh, if it comes back, I'm going to have to do something and do it quick. And so, but it never did stop or never turn. It never even offered to turn around. It just kept leaving, uh, going away from us all the time. And then Roger had to well, run can over. Can I ask you about that real quickly? Now knowing what you know, do you wish that you would have taken a shot so that you could bring it back and prove once and for all that these creatures exist? Uh, no, sir, David, I don't. Because uh, this big thing was walking like a human and uh, I'm not a violent person, or and if I'm not afraid or have to do something uh, to defend myself, I will not shoot anything, or I never have. And I've hunted big game all my life, uh, you know, deer, elk, cougar, bear, and uh, I've I've had to make some shots uh, with cougar and bear, uh, but. Uh, Maybe I could have got by without it, but I, I felt I had to. But I had no fear of half thinking I had to shoot. And this thing seemed so human-like, uh, the way it moved and the shoulders, the arms, and the legs. Uh, it was just, I was so amazed, actually, to see one mm -hmm. walking away like that and so impressed and so amazed uh, to know that they really did exist and uh, <laughs> Because there was, you know, there, I was kind of in the middle of the road about uh, all. I said, something's got to be making those footprints. But, you know, I, I still can't come to reality thinking about it real uh, till I saw one. You know, I might be kind of like Harry Truman in that aspect. You know, uh, I, 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 that's why I want to see more footprints or see some footprints I'm talking because I had never seen a footprint out. The only things I had seen was the cast, the, the plaster cast that different people showed me. And so this was all so incredibly real that uh, I, I was just kind of like in awe, but not, I uh, didn't have time to get scared uh, because that's basically what we were down there for. Right. And, and I was already pretty tired from riding long hours each day. And it was the 20th day uh, that we were down there. So uh, what was uh, being you know, said at that time, Bob? I mean, how were you guys reacting? Were you just trying to be as quiet as you could, as though you're almost deer hunting and just wanting to witness this captured on film? Were you talking back and forth to one another? Oh, no, no, we were not. The only thing Roger said to me, he wanted to relocate uh, to get a better angle. And he said, would you cover me, Bob? And that's the only words that was actually said. Because uh, all the rest of it was just fast moving action. And, uh, uh, of course, Roger was trying to get a better, uh, it was moving away quite a ways in kind of a moon-shaped uh, arc, you know, uh, because of the way the, the, the forests and the hills and stuff were. And the way it walked, of course, was on level ground with trees and, and downfall stuff in the way, but it never tripped or never stumbled or nothing walking over all that stuff, just like it wasn't even, it walked like there's nothing there. And so that were was there noises. Him. Did, did it make any type of, of noises, chatter, nope. growling, anything? No, nope, didn't hear a noise, not at all. Uh, of course, the crick was running, uh, but the crick wasn't loud. It was just running because low in October, you know, kind of running. It wasn't smooth, but it wasn't rippling, making noise, you see. So there was no noise at all. The only thing that, the only thing, like I said, is when Roger 
got up to get in a better position to get a, a better shot, a better uh, view so he could film it better. He just said, Bob, would you cover me? Well, that's when I rode across the creek and got down off the horse. And because, like I said, I knew I couldn't do anything if I was sitting on that horse jumping around. And uh, so that's kind of the way it all went in place there, David. Was there ever uh, a thought to continue to follow uh, the, this creature deeper into the, the woods? Or were you guys pretty satisfied with the footage that you, you had already caught? I'm glad you asked me that, David, because... I wanted to follow it. I got back up on the horse when it got out of our view and wanted to follow it. I wanted to see it some more. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roger said, don't leave me here. He said, I'm out of film and my horse is gone. And uh, he told me later that he thought maybe the, uh, I say the other two, uh, being as there was just that one and where there's three different sizes of footprints, he told me later that he figured that the other two might be right there in the woods. And so he didn't want to be left there. So uh, that way we went back, caught his horse up, it ran way back down on the trail, caught his horse up, caught the pack horse up, and tied them up, or tied the pack horse up, and we got Roger's horse back up there. He got some film out of the other saddlebag, put it in a camera. And then we did follow where, where we last, the way it, we last saw it traveling. And, of course, we never did get a chance to see it again. Uh, we've seen scuffs in the gravels uh, where it apparently ran because uh, the scuffs in the gravel, the best we could measure them was uh, 68 and 72 inches apart. Wow. So it apparently ran with a, a, approximately a six foot stride or a little over. And, uh, then we did see a, up this one Creek, the Creek that kind of was the main Creek. Uh, there was a half of a wet footprint on a big flat rock before it started up through the cliffs and up on the side of the hill. Well, still yet, I wanted to follow it up through there. It was steep, but I was young and great physical shape then. I knew I could follow it. And, and I, you know, it was just one of those deals. I didn't have a camera, but I just wanted to see it again. Right. And, uh, you know, and make sure that was what I was looking at was what we thought it was. And so Roger says, well, no, don't go up through there, Bob. It's getting a little late. We got to get back down to where... We first saw it and get some uh, 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 material and cast the footprints and also take some pictures of the, the what, how it all, how deep it went into the soil. And so uh, that's what we did, David. We went back down and I got up on a stump there about three and a half feet tall, jumped off. Uh, and at that time, I weighed about 175 pounds and jumped off with a riding heel and a cowboy boot and uh, uh, hit the ground with one leg, one foot hit the ground first. And the heel of the cowboy boot uh, never went in as deep as the, the track was. So we knew right away quick that there was some tremendous weight there. So then the other illustration that I did, I got up on the horse and rode it alongside the footprints as close as I could without disturbing them. Well, the horse was 1,200 pound horse and with me in the saddle and everything on there, we had quite a little bit of weight. And the horse's tracks, of course, it was distributed in four feet, uh, didn't go as deep as the, as the Bigfoot tracks. So that was another indication that it was extremely heavy. And, uh, you know, to me, uh, a, a big man was 285 pounds. And, and uh, so I was asked, well, what do you think it weighed, Bob? I said, well, I don't know, maybe 300, 350 pounds. And they said, well, how tall do you think it was? Well, my, ta uh, my, uh, 
description of that was I was sitting up on a 16 hand horse and it was quite a little ways away from me when I got down on the ground. So I said, well, it was probably over six feet tall. Uh, well, then later on, when Bill Munns measured it and took all the measurements and did things, it measured out seven foot four and three quarters inches. So I was off on uh, size, weight, and height. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it was a deal where I, I wasn't, I didn't really know what I was talking about. Right. Well, and but, you're eyeballing it, you're excited, you're just you're giving very, the best estimation you could. Absolutely, David. That's the way it was, you know, and uh, it, it just, uh, it happened fast. Did uh, your horses react? Were they uh, off put by the by this creature? Oh, Roger's horse. You know, uh, hey, David, I have to be careful what I say, because one time I said, Roger's horse just blew up. Well, some lady <laughs> stood up and says, how many pieces, Bob? And I said, well, no, no, no. Uh, that's just a cowboy phrase of saying thing. And, yeah, the horse I was riding jumped around and tried to buck a little bit, but I could stay on a horse pretty good because I was used to riding bronchi horses anyway. But Roger was trying to get off his horse while it was jumping around, jumping up and down. And Bing's Roger was a pretty good rodeo rider with bareback horses. He was able to get out of the saddle and uh, grab that camera out of the saddlebag. And his horse was just, uh, well, like I said, it blew up. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I learned that you have to be pretty careful about words that you use right. on things like that. So... Now, when you were when you were tracking it, were you picking up any kind of smell at all that seemed out of the ordinary? I know that there's been a lot said that that some of these creatures have a very musky, skunky scent to them, or was it, you know, nothing noticeable for you? No, that's what you just got through saying was exactly how I uh, explain it. And Rogers was a little bit different than mine, but I understood that too uh, because. I basically was a little closer to it than Roger ever was. Uh, you know, there was a few, uh, oh, probably 15, 20 feet closer, uh, and that don't mean I was that close to it, but I was uh, that much closer to it a couple of times than Roger was. And, and it had a kind of a skunky, musky stink to it. And course roger being a cowboy said it smelled like an old cow dog rolling in cow manure uh so you see uh both of us uh, could have been just a wee bit off but i thought that i was pretty accurate because uh, uh my my being able to smell was pretty good and it smelled like a kind of a musky skunky smell to me and uh of course, Roger said what he did about it, and uh, that's that was kind of, uh, you know, that was his description of what it smelled like. So, and same with my own. What and is that? So, what is that ride home like for the two of you? After this, you've you've seen you've you've got the holy grail. You've filmed a Bigfoot. You went. You found well, one. You filmed it. You followed it. You saw the footprints. Were you two just like two little kids on, on 4th of July just excited about the firework display you just witnessed? Well, that, basically, that's what uh, you're explaining it quite well because uh, uh, we, uh, uh, it was both of us had just a wee bit difference of what went on because I was being able to see it through my eyes and Roger was focused through the camera. And see, we weren't sure that he really got anything good because when he ran across the creek and fell down, uh, uh, then he never, uh, he didn't know whether the camp, whether he got sand or whatever dirt in the lens or what. So didn't know what the film would be. Didn't even realize what it was like until it was developed. And we saw it a few days later. And I'll just, uh, just talk a little bit about that. When I first saw it, I thought, well, that ain't much. Don't impress me at all, because <laughs> I saw more than that, and right. of course, that's pretty 
you know, <laughs> natural for a guy that's not looking to a camera uh, because, you know, I saw it good, really good. And I said, you know, that film is nothing. It's, it's nothing. So we didn't really get anything. Well, well I got an awful lot of ridicule about that uh, from the different people that come to view it. And, well, they said, why is old Bob thumbs down on that? That uh, film footage, that looks pretty good to me. And I said, don't look good to me. And uh, <laughs> so they kind of, I was the bad guy then, see, from did, then did on. Did it feel like it let the steam out of the excitement for you because you thought this footage is not going to impress anyone? That's exactly what I thought. And they kept telling me, oh, yeah, yeah, it's really good. I said, oh, no, it isn't either. Now, can so, you clarify again just for us? It was you and Roger that were on this little expedition. Was there any other person with you during any of this? No, sir. There was nobody else uh, in the, the area. The closest people that were in the area probably were way up on top of the hill where they were working on roads, uh, starting to build some roads up there. And I don't recall if they were working that day. I don't, you know, think, I, I wasn't paying much attention because Roger was taking uh, he was filming the, the trees, the leaves, and me leading the pack horse, and we just kind of lazily riding uh, back to where we were going to camp that night. And uh, then this all happened so dramatically quick uh, that it was just like it kind of all like it was a dream in a way, but it was real, but it was kind of like did it really happen? And uh, and then that's one of the reasons he ran out of film. Geez, he'd been filming all the way up through there with the, the beautiful colors of fall leaves and, uh, and then me leading the pack horse and different things. And um, so, uh, you know, it, it just all kind of was, uh, uh, it, if it would have been done a little different, it would have all been a lot better. I, uh, that's about the only way I can put it, you know, if, if we'd have known we were going to see one, uh, we darn sure would have had a full roll of film right. and, uh, <laughs> and then tried to follow it immediately and get more and, and just leave the horses alone and let them go, you know. But we had to get enough, had to catch Roger's horse back again to get any more new film in the camera. And, uh, and he Is had there- to get under. Oh, excuse me, David. I, w- I was just going to say, is there any point that you thought this might have been a joke, a trick being played on you guys at, at any junction from 1967 to today where you have to really second guess what happened that day? Uh, no, not really. You know, uh, uh, I, I, I thought uh, it can't be somebody in a suit. I can tell that right away. Uh, I wasn't. I didn't really know anybody that had been in a suit or anything, but you could tell that 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 there was no, uh, you know, no baggy, saggy things at all. It was all muscle and and hair and skin. Uh, but uh, the thing of it was, uh, it, it was there's. It never. You never. You still questions in your mind why and how not. To this day, it isn't, but shortly after that, because that night uh, we talked until the wee hours of the morning about what each one of us saw and uh, why why everything kind of happened like it happened. And and uh, so, you know, of course, Rogers thinks and, and his ideas about things were naturally somewhat different from mine. Uh, and uh, in what sense? Well, he was more familiar with what people had talked to him about, uh, uh, about the sightings that they'd seen or the evidence that they'd uh, gathered up. And, uh, and the only thing that I was going by was what Roger would, uh, the cassette tapes that he'd play about testimonials of people. So there was no... Uh, what you call solid, solid evidence or nothing solid for me to 
to lean back on or go mm-hmm. to. And, and, of course, Roger had been in uh, research for it for a number of years before I got involved in it, see. So he had a whole lot more uh, of an idea of what they were supposed to be like. And, um, and uh, he talked to the guys on the Slick Expedition uh, the different ones, and uh, later on in life, I talked to some of those guys after we got the film footage. But you know, I was kind of uh, the new kid on the block there, you mm-hmm. might say, uh, with it because I, I didn't, I didn't strongly believe they existed for a long time. When when Roger first exposed me to the the plaster cast and said, "Well, that's a Bigfoot truck," I said. Well, it darn sure is a big foot. You know, there's no question about the size of the foot. Uh, just, uh, I wanted more evidence. And I wanted to see footprints uh, and to really try to understand what this was all about because I didn't, I didn't know, you know. Well, there's been a lot of speculation because uh, Roger had, you know, tried to stop you from continuing to follow off and and follow the creature. That if there was a hoax, that maybe Roger had perpetrated this for the filming reason, and you weren't really let into that. How do you respond to that for the naysayers and skeptics out there? Well, you know, I don't know about the skeptics. I hear so much stuff going on, but when I saw where it disappeared uh, up through them cliffs and rocks, I thought, there's no human being. I could have probably made it by climbing uh, toe and hand, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, because I was in great physical condition at that time. I just turned 36 years old uh, uh, two days before we got the film footage. So I I was used to a lot of uh, exercise and climbing mountains and and, – uh, I could have made it up through there, but uh, I don't think the average person, well, if there'd have been somebody in a suit that could have done what I saw earlier, it could have probably, there's no way I don't think anybody could have ever climbed up through them rocks in that cliff. And we're going to talk, I, I had an interesting conversation um, back in June of 2014 with Philip Morris, and I know you recognize that name. Um, and I want to talk about it because to me, it's one of the weirdest parts of the story it, because talking to him, I thought we were about to really get the, the lowdown on how this story was hoaxed, how it was faked. And uh-huh. truthfully, I walked away thinking this guy's just inserting himself into a story and he can't even back up his own story with the information he's passing on. And, you know, we did it in a respectful manner and and enjoyed the conversation. But I want to talk about that when we come back after the top of the break um, here and and, and discuss that. And Bob Hieronymus and his insertion into the story and who he is to you and to Roger and and how you knew him. So I want to cover that. I want to I want to talk about many different aspects of this story. And and, uh, I appreciate that you're willing to be open with us on this and, and share the insights. So we're going to take a break. We've got a lot more to cover a whole nother hour with our guest, Bob. Bob Gimlin, as we continue to talk about probably the most famous piece of evidence regarding Bigfoot. What do you guys think?